Hello, good morning, everybody. And, and good, I, morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, Eve is professor at the University of Lausanne for wow, long time now, over a day, over a quarter of a century, and has held a professor, a visit, um, visiting professor at George State University, British Columbia, and a small university tucked away in Asia called the National University of Singapore, which is where we had the pleasure of connecting. Uh, yeah. It was almost a decade ago that there was a symposium that we were both invited to present and at the end of it i remember to this day how impressed i was with eve's uh presentation on business models and i was sharing uh strategy implementation and the two of us had an immediate connection and also uh antonio when he published his wonderful book the project revolution he worked with eve and alex developing the project um business model. So we're absolutely delighted to have Yves with us. He's uh, also along with Antonio on Thinkers 50. Uh, and, you know, he's one of the top ranked thinkers in our field. So we're absolutely delighted to have him presenting today on his new work that he's been putting together for three years. And as he's going to share on invisible companies. Okay. Yves, yeah. over to you. We we're going to ask yes. you to present for about 30 minutes, and then Antonio and I would like to have a conversation with you after that. That's good. Okay, so insights into the Invincible Company. The Invincible Company is the title that we gave with Alex. Uh, in fact, no, because of this crisis, we could have called this one insights into the resilient company. <laughs> uh, we started to work uh, 20 years ago with Alex. Uh, and 10 years ago, we published this book and we create uh, this uh, business model canvas here <coughs> to, to map out your business model. Uh, five years ago, we uh, created this value proposition canvas for designing and testing your value proposition. And uh, last month, we released this invincible company to manage your portfolio and create. And the topic for today is uh, related mainly to this one. In fact, we started to work, as Robin mentioned it, uh, three years ago with Alex in this small village in Switzerland, in the Swiss Alps, in summer 2017. And this is the first draft that we created for the business model portfolio. For us, invincible company, what does it mean? So the invincible company is first constantly or at least regularly we invent themselves. Second, they compete on superior business models and not only on product services or technology. And finally, they transcend industry boundaries, it means that they, they are able to go outside their core uh, industrial sectors, if you want. So there's Ping An, it used to be an insurance company and now it's number one in healthcare or online medical platform. Again, those three characteristics for us is something that's very meaningful to be resilient because of some crisis and the recent one is the uh, atomic bomb crisis. The agenda for today is first portfolio management. What does it mean? Second, competing on business model patterns. And the last one, establishing an innovation culture. Let me start first with portfolio management. You know, if you are a startup, you have an idea. And so you try to search the right business model. If you find it, you can launch, you can execute, you can operate, you can manage your business. So this first part here, this search is a very messy process with back and forth, with very iterative because you don't know exactly where you are going. And then for the other one, it's maybe more linear. For an existing company, it's the reverse. Okay, so they are mainly good in executing their core business, so they exploit their activity. But sometimes they have also to consider this exploration in high uncertainty, if you want. And it's not or and or, but it's plus. So exploring and exploiting. So it means that they need to be ambidextrous. That's the reason why, based on this one, we created what we call the portfolio map with two different portfolios. One here is 
for the business model you are searching, so you are exploiting, uh, you are exploring and vending. And the second one here is the exploit portfolio, representing, visualizing all the portfolio, uh, all the business model you have to operate and you try maybe to improve or to grow. Let me give you first a short illustration. Logitech, you know, I'm sure that you use their <laughs> mice or keyboards. It's a Swiss company based here on the campus. And here the CEO, Bracken Darrell, in the last six, seven years, they went from the peripheral only for computers, but also now for uh, gaming, music. So the leading cloud peripheral player. And let me show you. Here you have the axis, which is the return. And here, the most contributing business model are on the top. So for example, productivity is one more than 1 billion. And the last one is smart, but you have uh, gaming, you have music, you have video. And now you have the second axis here is what we call the disruption risk. So there are some business model which could be at risk, even for Logitech. Gaming is clearly not at risk, but music and smart is maybe more at risk. So it means that they will try to improve in the year coming. But there are some other operations on the business smart portfolio. One is to divers. For example, they decided to spin off life size and also acquisition. So it means they have acquired some companies to reinforce the gaming uh, sectors for them. And they have also acquired some two big names, Blue and Jaybird, for hearset and speakers for music. So this is the way of representing uh, the, uh, <coughs> the, the portfolio uh, of Logitech in this case. Exploring the game is completely different because it's the kind of behavior that you can observe for uh, startups. So it means that you are searching for the right business model. You do not operate those business models. So it means that you have mainly two different operations or actions, if you want. So designing first. Designing means you try to create a business model with interesting potential expected return using some techniques such as brainstorming, ideation, prototyping, simulation, assessing. And then when you have a business model, it means that you will try to test it. And test it means that you will try to reduce the innovation risk. It's not disruption because it doesn't exist yet. So it means you try to reduce the potential risk that you could have if you launch this business model. And you try to detect the hypothesis, then you experiment that you have some insight, learnings, and so on. And so <clears throat> based on those two main activities, designing and testing, you will take in managing such portfolios some action. First, you create some new ideas. Second, you persevere if the test shows you or the evidence you collected shows that it's possible to go further. Or you could pivot, means that you have to change something because the business model you had in mind is not good. Or you can kill some project or retire if you want. And finally, if you were able to push this business model on the right hand side on the top with interesting return and maybe a risk which has been reduced, you can launch, means you can transfer from the exploration to the exploitation portfolio. Yves, quick, sorry, interrupt you just one second. Do yes. you prefer questions at the end or can we ask you along the way? No, at prefer? the end, maybe, because some okay. I will have questions first and then we will come Okay. Back. And so please co uh, collect those questions. I will yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Thanks. I mean that if you need to kill some project, it means that sometimes you fail. And so here I have a question for you. And you will use the chat room or the chat window uh, in a click meeting. I'm asking how many big innovation projects, uh, innovation bi uh, projects or business ideas does it take to produce a mega success? And I know Antonio know, knows the answer. But for <laughs> the other one, <laughs> okay, so how many projects you need to inject in this portfolio to go, 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 test, 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 then launch, and you have a big success at the end. For a huge company, such as an international, multinational company, the success here is maybe hundreds million uh, annual revenue. So the question for you is how many 
project you need to launch. And please use the chat window. Okay, type a number. 10, 50, 1,000, 1 million, I don't know. I okay. Didn't, okay, 250 for some, 100. Sebastian. Okay. okay, be active, please. Go, go, only two. 50, Fernando. Great, no, number. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Yes, I will try to explain. Uh, well, Eve knows. <laughs> okay. Let me show you. I think it's around 100, 200 projects. So maybe 250 could be a That's good all? number. Yes, you will see why. Because if you invest 100,000 for 250, make the computation, it's I number. And here you will have, you will have maybe a big number. But the, the, the numbers that you have to keep in mind is at least 66% of those projects will fail. Maybe for an SME company is uh, less, so it could be 10 projects you launch, but again, same number. Six will fail, and maybe only three will be a kind of successful business model. Why those numbers? Here is for the early stage investment for startups. Look, six out of 10 lose money, so the return is lower than the investment. Only three of them make some money, and four out of 1,000, so one on, out of 250, will be home run. So means the return will be 50 times more your investment. And let me show you an actual number for a big company. You know Bosch. Okay, so Bosch launched three years ago an acceleration program, and EUA is, the, is responsible of this program, and it's a re really a uh, fast structured capital efficiency process for validating business model, testing business model. So they accept a team, uh, 30 teams every semester. Okay, so in the last three years they have accepted, they have selected 200 teams. They give them $120,000 and three months for exploring the IDs and testing those IDs. After three months, they have a second selection process and they have only selected 60 teams in the last three years so it means that 70 percent fail and the third selection for launching those businesses they have only accepted 15 businesses so it means roughly seven percent compared to this number here okay so it means that it's a funnel you need to manage this funnel and you cannot pick the winner without investing in the losers. This is a big lesson. Okay, let me know, <laughs> trying to explain uh, what we call a pattern. We introduced this concept in the first book in Business Model Generation, but in this book, we refined it and we came with more, more, much more precise uh, <laughs> illustration or uh, cases if you want. So for us, a pattern is a repeatable configuration of different business model building blocks. Okay, so the blocks that we have here, the nine blocks of the business model canvas, that could be a source of inspiration for creating or improving business models. So we have two libraries, one for exploration, one for exploitation. The first one we call that invent patterns, and the second one shift patterns. Let me visit first the invent patterns. So the invent patterns is something that could be used when you try to design good business model and when you are searching the right business model. So it means the pattern that you can see here, okay, is something that could be interesting for creating new business model. In no case, I will just try to use this one as an illustration of the different patterns. It won't be possible for me to visit all the patterns. We created a library of roughly nine invent patterns. Some are what we call the front stage, concerning customers or channels or relationship with the customers. Some others concern the backstage, means we have some patterns where the epicenters is the resources or activities or partnerships you could have. And finally, we have patterns mainly based main, uh, where the epicenters are mainly on all the revenues, all the, uh, the cost structures. So what we call revenue differentiators or cost differentiators. Let me ask you a question. And again, you can type very quickly in the chat room. 
what do these three business models have in common? Amazon Web Services, cloud computing, Dyson vacuum or vacuum cleaners, and waste, uh, automobile traffic management. And do you know what you could consider as something which is common in those three business models? Okay, who knows? Oh, no, no, it's for the, okay, type, type. Try to, to come with something that's key for explaining the success of those three companies. Data leveraging, echo of scale, creating new market. It's true for Amazon Web Services, not maybe less clear for Dyson, because vacuum cleaners is a very whole business. Okay, so first, we consider that they created a competitive advantage with key resources that are difficult or maybe impossible to com for competitors to copy. We call that resource castle. Let me illustrate it with Dyson, created by James, James Dyson, an inventor and, and the founder of Dyson. For us, it's, this is clearly what we call a pattern. Okay, so the epicenter is here. And based on this one, they were ready to create a new value proposition. So in this case, is the intellectual property. They have a lot of patterns. You see, it was, uh, James was a, an inventor. So it means that they have key activities, which is research and development, which is quite key for them. Six times more than all the competitors. Based on this one, they created this value proposition with a premium and with premium price, meaning that a vacuum cleaner is sold for 700 and you can find vacuum cleaners for $40, uh, okay? So based on this one, they were able to sell uh, 100 million machines in 2017, 80 million per, per year. So this is clearly what we call a pattern with a big epicenter, in this case, the resources, for all of those patterns, we can illustrate it with a lot of case studies because the resource could be different for Amazon Web Services. It was the IT infrastructure. For Dyson is what we have seen it. It's the patterns, intellectual property. And for this one, it's a lot of customers using the, the, the mobile app. For all of them, we can give some trigger questions. In this case, or could we make difficult to copy resources a key pillar of our business model. I mean, those trigger questions is something that could be useful when you are creating the business model, inventing, designing business model. And we have also, for all the patterns, we have nine questions, what we call questions for leaders. In this case, do we own key resources that are difficult, impossible to copy, and <clears throat> which give us a competitive advantage. So it means for the leaders, they have nine questions. So when they receive a business model, when a business model is pitched, they have the right question for assessing those models. For exploitation, it's different. The uh, patterns will help to improve existing business model between, because in exploitation, all the business models are executed. Okay, so it's for improving. So a pattern is different. A pattern is you have an existing business model from, and then you apply this canvas or if this shift pattern for creating a new one that you will execute in the next uh, stage. Again, we created roughly 20 different um, shift patterns. One bay where the epicenter is mainly value proposition shifts some for the front stage, like for example here, from niche to market or from B2B for, to B2C, direct access to the customers, from low tech to high tech, or sometimes from high tech to low tech. Nintendo Wii is a nice example. We have also some backstage driven shift uh, from dedicated to multi-usage, so from asset heavy or resource heavy to resource light, from close to open innovation and some shift mainly based on the uh, profit formula from high cost to low cost or transactional to recurring revenue and so on. One example from product to recurring service. So it means that a company executes a manufacturing and selling company and they decide to switch or to 
shift towards a service offered to a new channel to the customers and generating, ah, interesting, a recurring revenue uh, with this business model. Again, we have strategic reflection or questions for the leaders. Or might we grow recurring predictable revenues by providing a recurring service rather than selling the product? Uh, ILTI is a nice example. Ten years ago, they switched, if you want, or they shifted from selling manufacturing and selling high-quality tools for construction site to selling tool fleet management service, an online fleet management service. Here, the CEO of the company, Christos Lou, say, and this shift, the big benefit of this shift <coughs> towards recurring service revenues helped us to stabilize and to grow our business during the financial crisis. Here's the numbers. In 2009, they had 20% shift in the annual revenue. Okay, big problem because of the crisis of 2008. And so they came with this online fleet management system. They shifted. And so they were able to increase their progressively their annual revenue. And now it's more than 30%, which is realized with the online fleet management system. So what they have done, Okay, they had this manufacturing and selling tool. They apply this technique from product to service, and you can recognize the online tool plan management system, online channel reaching the, co the company, the recurring revenue is coming, and they had to adapt the activity and the, the cost structure to be able to operate. So big success. And it's what we have done with all the different shifts, again, the shift is presented, the pattern is presented, and we have a couple of illustrations for each of them. So it's a, if you know, it's a, if you want, it's a toolbox to be able to or create new business model or to improve existing one. Finally, establishing an innovation culture. Why? Because innovation seems to be very complicated in companies, mainly big companies, because they often believe that it's managing project. Find the right idea execute the plan, check the result, avoid failures, predict the future based on the past, on their previous knowledge. And this one is very good for the exploitation portfolio. That's clear. But for exploration, because of this completely different behaviors that we applied in this uh, for those business models for finding, searching the right one, is maybe not possible. So again, because of uh, company need to be ambidextrous, the exploitation portfolio culture is good. It cherishes the management systematic improvement and growth in of existing business model. But we need also to have an exploration culture, which cultivates creation, discovery, validation, testing, acceleration of new business ID uh, for organizations. Okay, and we use a tool that we developed with Dave Gray long time ago. I think in 2013, we start to work to work with him and we came with what we call the culture map with three components here, the behaviors, uh, the outcomes, the behaviors that you can observe inside your company, uh, the outcomes, the performance that you could reach and what we call the enablers and blockers. This one, you can observe those ones. It's not possible to design a culture or design the outcome. You can observe those ones. But this one is something that you can design, but not as design like a car, but design like a garden. Okay, so it means that if you want to have nice flower or nice food, you need to cultivate your garden with, and you need to put water, good seeds, fertilizers. And so it means that when you are designing an innovation culture, the alone ways of improving this culture and creating this innovation culture is to work on the enablers and blockers. And I will briefly in the last five minutes present those uh, different things. Okay, so behaviors. If you want to have an innovation culture, you need to have roughly uh, to observe all those behaviors such as eagerness to invent, to be pioneer in your field or in some other field. Uh, you need to be able to have people, employees working for your, uh, your company 
to choose innovation as a career path, which is not so common. In most of the big companies, innovation is a career suicide. Okay? And having also maybe a systematic measurement of risk reduction using some new ma um, innovation metrics. If you have this kind of behavior, if you are able to generate those behaviors, maybe you could have some outcomes such as this one, innovation growth in your strategy, such as resilient to change and disruption, your company be resilient to change. You could have also to observe new growth and genes inside your company or to retain uh, and leverage innovation talents in your company to be able to go further. And you could also have some reduced innovation risk, okay? Be able to launch something where you are pretty sure that it will be successful. But if you want to have this outcome and you have some, and you have some blockers such as this one, short-term financial quarterly focus of leadership <laughs> or bureaucracy slowing down innovation or reward system. If you give a bonus, if you are efficient, people will never try to explore because you could fail. And if you use the execution KPI for measuring innovation, it won't be good because innovation, you need to measure the risk reduction and not the performance because it doesn't exist yet. But if you are able to come and to promote some, what we call enablers, so means something that enable your development of this culture, such as resource allocation, the strategic guidance, the support of the leadership, or, and I will take those two one, legit, legitimacy and power. Because even if you done, if you give money to your innovation lab or innovation centers or for the exploration portfolio, if you don't give the legitimacy it will be always very difficult to fight with the CEO, CMO, CFO of the company. You need to give the power to the people in charge of innovation, bridge to the core. So a company is not a startup. Even if they explore such as a startup, they have some advantage because they can share some resources that you have already developed in your company. I will have a last question for you. How much time? does your CEO personally spend on innovation every week? Or if you are CEO of a company, how much time you spend or you did spend last week for the innovation aspect, I mean innovation, creating new business model? Okay, this is a question for you. Uh, okay, you could type again in the chat room, how much, 10%? Three days, okay, 30 minutes, 25% of, the, of their time, so two days per week. Two days per week, okay, currently nothing, so zero. No, that's true. Okay. I'm, I'm impressed with the 25% from Terry. 25%, okay, good. Hi. Okay, so the question was this one, and we asked this question in the last three years, online or doing a masterclass and the last webinars we have organized. This one is the result of the online, but it's roughly the same. And in the last 30 webinars we had in the last two months, it was corresponding to this one. 70% of the CEO spend less than 10% on pure innovation. And you have only 7% spending more than two or three days a week, such as we have seen, for example, uh, Bracken Darrell, he spent at least two or three days per week for creating new business models in the gaming industry, in the music industry. So when you see this kind of numbers, roughly confirmed by this poll that we have here on, on this chat room, you could ask, is it possible to have ambidextrous CEOs? Company, we want to have ambidextrous company, but is it necessary to have ambidextrous CEO? And we are not convinced because of those kind of statistic. So the suggestions that we came with maybe two, at least more than two years ago was, okay, we could have the traditional struct of the org chart for companies with uh, CEOs, but maybe it could be interesting to have a chief entrepreneur with the same power as the CEO, this one for the present, so means for the exploit portfolio, and this one for the future. Okay. And this one for the future with maybe 
a chief uh, internal ambassador to be able to deal with the big conflict between those two equivalent powers, if you want. And it's clear that we are here for balancing and for making the last decision. So based on those enablers that you are, I presented, we created what we call an innovation culture readiness assessment with nine questions, three questions for the leadership support, strategic guidance, resource allocation portfolio, organizational design with legitimacy and power bridge core. And for all of them, you are all beginners or world class. And so you can decide, okay, I'm good here, here I'm much less good or I don't. So the question with this kind of uh, forms, if you want, is are you ready for innovation? And if you have your cell phone, you can click this one and you will be able to see these forms on the Strategizer website. You can download it. That's for today. So what we have seen, <laughs> I presented briefly the portfolio map, then I show you one or two patterns, shift patterns or invent patterns, and then briefly what's an innovation culture. Thank you. After those 30 minutes, Swiss time. 30 minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Ease, so that was fantastic. I, I will stop sharing. So, oops. Okay. So you can take, and I'm ready for the questions, your questions. Over. So first of all, it's fantastic to see your thinking and to be able to share it so succinctly and using the graphics. It's always been one of your skill sets. So thank you for that. You are welcome. Uh, one of the early questions came was um, to move from test to design obviously varies depending on the company, but it, are we talking a few weeks, a few years? What are you, is there an average or a mean? Okay. I think we have. Uh, uh, so the question it, is, how long does it take to get yeah, from yeah, yeah. test to design? The shorter is the better. So it means that, for example, for an innovation sprint, or, uh, it's no more than 12 weeks. You have seen at Bosch, it was three months. In three months, you are able to manage and to test maybe 10 or 15 different hypotheses with maybe 15, 20 different experiments in contact directly with the customers. And then after, you will spend more, maybe six months, for all the feasibility and to demonstrate, to come with proof of concept. But at the beginning, it's a very short period, mainly for testing desirability of the product or the service or the value proposition you want to launch. And so I'm quite sure on those three months, we have seen that in many different companies and strategizers try to push to have no more than 10, 12 weeks at the beginning. And after, you need to assess and to have some good judgment, not based on intuition, but based on the evidences you collected during this test design testing activities. Do you know, we, we couldn't have set that up better. Um, one of the key messages in the Institute is having 90 days to get things done. And you just responded. Three months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same <laughs> number. <laughs> um, and I guess that Antonio will confirm. This, this yeah, program. it's what we built in for the Institute course, and it's all about building 90-day achievements. Yeah. Um, he's just staying on. Um, one of the biggest pushbacks is through culture. And, yeah. you know, with so many, you know, the, the failure rate for digital implementation, you know, is commonly um, shown from different res uh, surveys around 84% failure. And one of the top three reasons is the culture and you're talking yeah. about the innovation and exploiting and starting to create new business models. But how do you overcome in your model that resistance where employees don't feel the psychological safety to experiment sure. and take risk and the culture that pushes back? Okay. When I say that we need to balance uh, exploitation culture, innovation culture, it doesn't mean that all the companies will adopt the innovation culture. 
So for me, the innovation culture is mainly for people in charge of exploring and creating okay. new business models. And we can, I think, start in the small. Okay, we can learn in practicing, in working. And so it means that for those people, we need to guarantee this uh, psychological safety and so on to be sure that inside this acceleration program or innovation lab or innovation center, we can guarantee this kind of uh, enablers to achieve this kind of thing. And progressively, if the people is, uh, if the company is, uh, acquiring skills and competences in exploring maybe we will have a shift a little bit more between this culture you know uh, yeah. innovation culture and the exploitation culture and we okay. try to balance that's the reason why we were quite yeah. convinced that it's very difficult to uh, encourage this uh, uh, ex exploration innovation culture if you have only one boss having the same reflexes as uh, financial uh, performances and so on. So I think there's a reason why it could be interesting to have something which is a little bit uh, at the border of the exploitation and to be able to push a little bit this culture inside the company. And we have seen some companies having adopted this way, but it's very complicated. Few companies are quite successful to have this exploration culture. I agree. Okay. Um, one of the quick things, just while I'm going to ask you the next uh, observation and comparison, is can you put the QR code back up? Some of the yeah, participants sure, sure. are asking. Sure. Um, you showed a very, uh, uh, and I appreciate, sorry, Antonio, uh, last question before I hand over to you, sir. Um, I appreciate, um, one of the interesting stats for me was coming from your work in Europe compared to our work in Asia, or my work predominantly in Asia. Uh, I'm based in Singapore for those I haven't met. Um, you showed that uh, it's a 66% failure rate. Yeah. But in okay. Asia, we work on, uh, it's a 10% success rate, so a 90% failure rate. Okay. Wait a minute, I think I had the same numbers as you are, because when I say 66, it was completely failed. So it's a project that you need to stop ah, okay. in the world to kill. 30% yeah. is something that could be a little bit successful. So if you adjusted can go further, and you can or incorporate or you can push this in an existing business unit and you will see later. But my thing was one, out of 250, yeah. big success. So I think it's roughly the 1% that you are mentioning. Okay. And now I'm disappointed because I thought you had some great uh, secrets I could... <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Antonio. Okay, those, I think those numbers are quite good for big companies. For yeah, big, I agree. small companies or medium, it's not possible to launch 200 uh, projects yeah. to have one success. So it's okay. maybe more 10, 6 will completely fail three will be a medium success and one could be a good one. Okay, I'm sure Sebastian's taking those numbers as a new startup. <laughs> Antonio? Yeah, well, I I, I love what you're doing, Eve and, and Alex. I nice. think you're like the uh, apple of um, thinkers and tools because the design, the everything, it's just... Uh, incredible the level you reach is, is i love your books i love your slides i love your frameworks the time you put on design and, and making sure everything flows it's just uh, extraordinary so thank <laughs> Thanks, you for I'll that you. If it's you can see the value and, and the quality my question if we talk about leaders but what are the people below like the managers what do they yeah. need to do uh, to support this exploitation exploration to develop their skills we are very keen in the institute to develop strategy implementations which is tend to be more generalist and actually i read today an article that that's what companies are missing uh, so just wanted to to get your views on on the level below and how yep. can these people evolve and develop i think two different things if you can see here the last one Okay, is what we call innovation practice. I think managing existing business model of a company and exploring new one is two different jobs if you want. So one is more entrepreneurial, the other one is more managerial. 
it's not the same competencies it's not the same skills those one you know the other ones is you need to master the techniques which is mainly used by startups if you want so you need to master the innovation tools such as business model canvas lean startups you need to manage the process to be able to go further and to manage innovation sprints and manage the funnel you have inside this one. And you need to manage the, clearly the skills. And one of them is to act and to, because you have a culture which accepts the psychological safety, you need to practice and to be able to uh, have team, which teams uh, and teamwork. And mainly those teams are multidisciplinary so you need to master the skill to discuss with people with design skills uh, testing skills uh, management skills and so on. so i think this one is clearly if you have no skills you need to acquire them to switch uh, a little bit on this way and that's one thing and also and that's the reason why we were convinced that you need to change the rewarding systems in the company, at least for the people working in the exploration innovation, because we need also to guarantee that if you have those skills and competences and so on, even if you know a failure of one of your projects, it's not a big issue for this kind of things. And for example, you, have, you remember the numbers I presented for Bosch when I say that 70% failed at the first, at the second selection, and 70% again at the third uh, step, the stages, so uh, selection. Uh, in fact, they are able to recycle those team on the team continuing after the second or third selection to reinforce the team because they have acquired some knowledge and they are able to work together in those teams. So I think it's a different ways of organizing the job inside, the exploration. And I think the people, number managers and some second, third and so on, uh, what we call sometimes entrepreneurs in, in those companies, yeah. uh, is clearly a, a, a skill set that they have to acquire. Thank you. If I have one more question and then we can take other. Um, yeah. I, I've been debating a lot about projects and, and when is a project a project? Because I think one of the biggest reasons why projects fail is because we love to start projects. So there's an idea and we call a kickoff meeting tomorrow and everybody will show up. But maybe it's just an idea. It's not a project. There's a learning curve. I wrote about the S curve. Uh, we should yeah, yeah. never start the project at the bottom of the S because we're learning, we're exploring, we're and and I don't know what's your take. When should be a project be called a project? I think most of the time it's just exploration. Is it's hard to call it a project? Maybe an initiative. I don't know how you see that. Maybe just yeah. definitions. But I think one of the biggest reasons is that we we start projects too early. Yeah, there's a reason why. Uh, the, the project that most of the company knows is project uh, in the exploitation world. In the exploration world, the project for me is a business ID. So it's a business yes. model ID. Is we say, okay, we could make businesses in this field or with this kind of uh, cust uh, customers or products or service or technology. This is a business ID. And we prefer to call that business ID than just project. That's the reason why it's a business Very idea good. for us. Is a business idea you will explore and you will try to push this after a couple of months to be able to execute. And then at this stage, it's becoming an execution process. Project mean okay, find or uh, execute the plan, check the result, and so on. Because at this stage, it's too late to make big experiments. You execute and you are is much more certain to reach the objective. At this stage, you will have some projects stopping and you need to be ready. That's the reason why we mentioned this idea of funnel uh, and okay, business ideas, not yeah. uh, execution projects. So. I love it. Thank you. If there's one thing that we want to push in there, we're pushing in the strategy implementation 
is that yeah. experts should be able to say, we're not ready for the project. We're still in business ideation. And so don't call it a project. That for me is a, an implementation profession, I will say to the leaders, is not ready. You need six more months to do ideation. Now we have the characteristics of the project, the upper box, and now we can implement. I think this is something that we can teach, and we want to teach that. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Robin. Back Eve, to you. There, there's one question everybody wants to know, which I'm not going to ask. So we'll, no. <laughs> one of the questions is: Are you using Miro.com, or what software are you using to present? Oh no. <laughs> okay, we present just uh, we use Keynote with Alex for I don't know seven years or. A keynote is the equivalent of PowerPoint yeah, yeah. The oh, Mac, Apple. Uh, yeah. world. And all the animation is done inside. So we, I, for this presentation, I use only a keynote with some transition if you want. OK, thank you. Uh, going to the questions on your content, Andre is asking, I'd like to know what kind of framework are the companies using to support and explore I get to 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 do the exploration and exploit phase. So, is there any specific frameworks you mentioned? The blue um, blue ocean. Oh, no, no. Uh, we can. Wait a minute. Uh, no, so worries. you mentioned yeah. for exploration. So, oops, uh, this one. <laughs> All the framework could be used. We never tried with Alex. To come with a Swiss knife means a tool which is able to do everything. So the idea you have seen it at the beginning we presented the canvas, the business model canvas for it. It was a nice tool for presenting, uh, for mapping out uh, the business model uh, of your company, and the value proposition is another tool. The two ones that I present today. Uh, was also some frameworks that we can use for the portfolio or the culture map. Uh, and we have some others, one for exploring, for example, the environment of your company. Uh, and we can use the uh, framework suggested or the strategic uh, canvas uh, suggested by Blue Ocean. Uh, so all the tools, what we try to show or to have or to do is to show the synergy between those different tools. So for example, with the blue ocean strategy, okay, we can say, okay, we will try to target and uh, some kind of new customers, uh, blue customers, if you want. Mm -hmm. And then this one is mainly here and the, the strategic canvas is the fit between, oops, uh, those two, oops, yes, wait a minute. Uh, no worries. Yeah, you have seen. There we go. There we go. Uh, and so the idea is to use the best tools in your toolbox and trying to have one for a very specific goal and to also show the synergy between those two tools. Okay. Th thank you, Yves. Uh, Farhat, I hope I get your question right. I was just trying to clarify with you. Uh, Farhat says, thank you very much for your explanation. Or is it with the economic intelligence with the business plan models? So I guess he's asked, if I understand correctly, it's a correlation of the economic intelligence and the models. Okay. How are you using data? I think that's where you're perhaps coming from. <laughs> First, you know, I heard in your question, business plan. For, me, for us, it's a terrible tool for exploration because in the, most of the time in business plan, you say, my objective <laughs> is this one, my numbers for the next five years are those one, those one, Good those answer. one. <laughs> and yeah. this one, I think, is not the best tool for exploring because we have seen that at least one or 200 projects will fail. And so most of the time when uh, a startup uh, propose a uh, business plan at the bank, you know that they will never reach the objective <laughs> inside those uh, plans. So for me, a business plan or business cases is good for exploitation again because you have a, a relatively certain world but not for exploration. So inside the company, the tools such as um, the business model canvas or that portfolio map are the tool for structuring your ID. The lean startups is a way of structuring the processes for testing the different yep. uh, hypotheses. And 
the what we call the economic intelligence will some information you will collect from outside for testing some hypothesis of your business model when you will try to push this business model in the economical environment. But it's only for the testing? No, it's something really or for the testing because the, the idea of business intelligence trying to have a good overview of what happens in the environment is some interesting data is not enough because customers is much more important as most of the competitors or regulation in some situations. But I think it's mainly to be able to collect data and to say, if this kind of things happens in the environment, my reaction inside my business model will be this one, this one, this one. So for me, it's much more in the idea of assessing the future of a business the model. Future. Okay, thank you. The future. A couple more questions. One from yep. Sebastian. Um, great insights. I'm launching a startup. I just got my first investor on board. Well done, Sebastian. That's a major achievement. Uh, what's the question? Okay, sorry. I thought he had a question there. About him. Okay, sorry. Let me ask you another one. Okay. Uh, Jovita is asking. Question for Ease, as a startup business, we may not have all the answers slash information to complete the canvas, as there's a number of unknowns. How can a startup benefit from this process? Like the question, okay. thank you. No, 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 no. I think a startup, they design a business model. So for me, they need to design the nine blocks. But based on those okay. the nine blocks, they are, based on some hypothesis. I think my customers will love this one. I think I will use this channel. I think that without these resources, I won't be able to operate. I think that this uh, revenue streams, which is recurrent, is better than uh, transactional one. This one is something that I design. I extract the hypothesis. Then I test all those hypotheses. Yeah. If those hypotheses are validated, you can continue. If not, you need to take a decision. Stop the project, uh, pivot your project, uh, trying to have more money to test more or something. So I'm quite sure that at least with the, the business model canvas, the value proposition canvas, and all the techniques we develop in those two things is clearly for the business model, uh, for the uh, startups. And Alex also, uh, is co-author of another book, Testing Business Ideas, that uh, David Bland has written, and with different techniques that you can use for testing hypotheses. This one is clearly three tools or, for the startups. Those two ones that I mentioned afterwards is mainly for existing company because the startups have no existing businesses and the culture is main is most of the time not an issue because his friends are wanting to create companies and so on. So yeah. this idea to balance exploitation, exploration, culture is not meaningful. So this one is mainly for existing company. This one is for startup. But for existing company, because of this exploration, they use also those different tools. And I guess if there's one thing we've seen in implementation, it's to to when something is not working, uh, have the courage to stop it and move yeah. on. Don't don't I, keep throwing resources at it. Fully agree. That's the reason why I mentioned. Uh, you remember? Yep. The take the actions. So it means that okay, you learn. If everything is going well, persevere. If not. Or you change your business model or your business ideas, or you kill it. And you need to be ready to kill some ideas. It's not possible to have 200 success out of 200 business ideas. You need to be ready to kill. And most of the time in existing company, we have what we have seen is the people judging those business models were based on their intuition, which is not good. That's the reason why we uh, provide them with what we call a uh, project scorecard, uh, yeah. business ID scorecard, when we try to force them to judge the project to kill or to persevere or to uh, maybe to go further, based on the evidences that the teams have collected during this test, the uh, design testing process. Yeah, 
And uh, just connecting to the work Antonio and I are doing, we're also seeing it's having the culture that when you do kill, you get rewarded for killing rather than punished. I fully agree. That's the reason why one of the enablers I mentioned was this idea of rewarding. I say bonus, is, uh, bonus to efficiency is not so good, but bonus for uh, having maybe killed a project and having having learned something from this failure could be a good way of restarting a new project and going further for some other project. I agree with you. Okay, thank you. So um, just uh, one or two last uh, questions for you. We really appreciate your inputs and your time. Uh, I knew that I saw a question from you, Sebastian. The question is, how do we speed up the usage of such tools within Restraint for Change? Industrial B2B organizations that are focused on piloting uh, meaning short term versus pivoting, meaning long term. I'm not sh sure that pivoting is long term. I'm yeah. Not sure. Piloting is for me exploiting. You pilot a, 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 an execution pro a project. Pivoting for me is you make a major change inside the business idea or the business model that you want to investigate or to create or to test or to assess. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure to understand this question. If the question is, oh, we can push all those tools and techniques inside company, I would say you need to start in the small. Most of the time, when you have a lot of money that you put in the exploration or innovation lab or centers or acceleration program, you will lose money. So we need to be ready to start with a small amount of money to learn all to practice those testing techniques and design techniques and so on and uh, learn to kill project and to assess project or business ideas yeah. uh, i think it's uh, yeah and more you have acquired competency skills more it will be better and you so you can put more money inside this inside one. It. and i okay. think learning in the small could be a good lesson we have seen such many so many innovation lab or initiatives killed and uh, Siblang like to say innovation theater. Okay. Uh, here we just got time for the last question. This could be a short answer. Uh, is agile project management used for the exploration phase? Clearly, clearly, yes. I think agile is a way to say, okay, you need to design, to test, to have some very small sprint or to have a pace which is quite uh, high. Or So I think for me, Agility is clearly a requirement for the exploration. Fully agree. Okay. Now, I'm very conscious that you do have the new book out, but uh, you haven't shown us where we can get it from for those who'd like more. Have you got a... <laughs> okay. So I think the best way is to use the, the thing I mentioned at the end is the strategizer.com. You will have seen books, and so you will see the, all the four books. Uh, Do you want to put the barcode, like the QR yes, code yes, back yes, up, yes, just yes, for? And the, the the barcode is mainly for the uh, the innovation culture readiness. is directly the PDF, but if you go a little bit back and you have just strategizer.com, you will see the book, and the book and is will... available in different libraries online or not. The, the good thing is uh, it was very difficult for us to be supplied by Amazon, for example, .com in Europe. But in uh, Singapore, it's, it was quite easy so far. So people having ordered the book were ready to receive it in two, three days. And here in Europe, it was one or two months. Oh, wow. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> terrible. So we have people having ordered this one in April. They didn't receive yet in Portugal, for example. Antonio? Well, like, thank you, Eve. Thank you for everyone to be there. Thank you, Robin, for organizing. Great, great session. And yeah, so much to think, so much to learn. And it's so much in line with what we want to do, Robin, on the Implementation Institute. So thank you, Eve. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank I you, could thank listen you. To thank you, you for Antonio. Hours. Thank you, Robin. Like, it's great pleasure to be with you. And thank you, everybody. Eve, it's always a delight. We really appreciate your time. To everyone, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's strategy implementation, so it's all about attention to detail. And that's our six uh, our hours on the dot. <laughs> thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.